All right, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, hello, my name is Zoe Mills. I am the Adult Programming and Community Outreach Librarian at Trader from Public Library. Thank you so much for joining me tonight to go over a Computer Basics webinar. Um, please make use of the chat and the Q&A function throughout the presentation to ask any questions along the way. I'm happy to answer anything that might come up. And as always, please let me know if I'm going too fast or too slow, or if you want me to go back over anything that I mentioned. I will be throwing a lot of information at you. Uh, so again, please ask questions along the way or tell me to slow down or uh, speak quicker. Before we get started, I wanted to make a quick announcement. Uh, all of us at the library have been proud and delighted to be able to serve the community in a multitude of ways throughout the pandemic. Virtual programs like this one, plus electronic materials, reference chat, curbside pickup, and more have kept the community inspired, engaged, and connected. But the pandemic has also caused a loss of revenue at our libraries and has increased many costs. Now it is likely that cuts to services and programs may come. If you can give any amount, we are very grateful for your support. Click the link in the chat to donate tonight. Uh, if you did pre-register for this program, you did receive a PDF version of this presentation, so you can always follow the link when reviewing that handout. I also forgot to mention that this webinar is being recorded and it will be posted to our YouTube channel if you want to reference it at a later time. All right, so uh, I wanted to go over some tips and tricks for basic use. Um, this webinar really boils down computer basics. Um, if we were in person, I would go over a lot more specific things in terms of like how your computer works and skills you can um, enhance like with typing and, and mouse use. Um, but I'm gonna skip most of that for now just because we are virtual uh, and you are on a computer. But I do want to give you some tips and tricks to enhance the skills that you already have. First things first, I really wanted to provide a, a glossary for you or a kind of like index of words that you'll hear often when working with computers. Um, so I'm just going to go over these really quickly. The first is operating system and this is what makes your computer work on a basic level. Um, so if you are a Windows user, um, you are working on Microsoft computers, Apple computers run on Mac OS, and Google Chromebooks run on Chrome OS. Downloading and uploading kind of go hand in hand. Downloading is when you copy or save data from one computer system to another. So an example of this is saving a photo from Google onto your computer. And uploading is transferring data from one computer system to another. Uh, and an example of this is adding photos to your Facebook profile from your computer. Next is hardware. These are the physical components of your computer, such as your mouse, keyboard, motherboard, anything that you can physically touch it will be called hardware. And software are programs or other operating information. They're usually things that have come downloaded onto your computer already, or you have to download. So an example would be like Microsoft Word or even Zoom is considered software. And then I also wanted to quickly go over file extensions. Um, the extension itself is just a suffix. Uh, it's a little acronym that'll give you information about the format of the file that you're interacting with. So I listed the most common file extensions, which include PNG, which is a photo, a JPEG, which is another photo. They're the same thing. Um, PNGs are usually higher quality photos, whereas JPEGs are compressed. So they uh, take up fewer, it takes up fewer space on your computer's hard drive. A GIF, or often referred to as a GIF, is a moving photo. Again, it's a high quality photo. PDF is a portable document format, and usually PDFs are not editable. Um, so the PDF that I sent you this afternoon of this presentation is a document that you cannot edit, but you can still read the document. A dot .doc or a dot uh, docs, docx is a Microsoft Windows document. A dot .doc is the original, um, I think it was pre-2013 Microsoft Word, and a dot uh, docx is the current format of Microsoft Windows. 
an mp4 is a video with audio and an mp3 is just an audio file so like music or a recording I also wanted to give you kind of a data bank of shortcuts that you can even just print out at home if you want to to kind of have um, on the side by your computer to remind you these shortcuts I think I pretty much use on a daily basis I know I use um, the control tab and the show or hide desktop quite frequently on my daily use or in my daily use also let me know um, what sort of computer you have at home a windows a mac or a google chrome in the chat so that i can give you specific advice uh, depending on your operating system uh, i am a mac user but i do have experience in windows so i can talk about both operating systems this list will give you the commands or the shortcuts for both a PC or a Windows computer or and a Mac. So control plus whatever key stroke it is, that's going to be for a Windows computer and command plus a certain keystroke will be for your Mac. So control or command plus C is to copy highlighted text. Usually you would highlight the text with your mouse or trackpad, right click and then click copy off of that uh, drop down menu. With the control plus C, you could just highlight control C at the same time and it'll automatically copy it for you so you you do save time without having to right click control plus V is uh, pasting any copied or cut items control plus tab or command plus tab is switching in between open windows if you are a multitasker um, or you're switching between say uh, a Google web page you found and a word document you can just tap uh, or at the same time click command con or command tab or control tab and it'll switch between the open windows control alt delete or command option escape is what we call the three finger salute uh, and this is to help when you have frozen programs um, this primarily works best with windows computers um, when you do the three finger salute when you hit control alt delete at the same time it'll bring up a window uh, that lists all of the programs that are currently open and running on your computer and you can find the problem program on that list and force quit it so it'll it'll close it out completely uh, so if it's uh, say you're working on a letter on um, Microsoft Word if you were to quit it without saving you would lose all of your work so you want to only use this in emergencies if your computer is frozen. Windows plus D or just the F3 key on Mac will show or hide your desktop. This is really handy. Uh, if you just want to go back to your desktop in a pinch, you just click those two keys and it will take you to your desktop. The next ones are primarily used when you are working in a word processing program or even PowerPoint, Outlook, Excel, any program where you're inputting information. Control plus S is to save any edited document. Um, as out of habit, I constantly hit Command S or Control S about every, I would say, couple or minutes or so when I'm working on something like a PowerPoint, an email, or even a Word document, just so that it saves, it's constantly saving. If the program were to crash, I would lose everything up to when I saved. So if you save frequently by clicking Control S, you'll have the most uh, updated document or the, your most updated version on your document. Control plus Z is a lifesaver. Uh, it undoes any previous action and then control plus Y redoes your previous undo. Control plus B bolds any highlighted text. Control plus U underlines any highlighted text and control plus I uh, italicizes any highlighted text. And again, these last three are primarily used in like a word processing program. Since I had to kind of readjust my usual presentation um, just because of the nature of the webinar being virtual, I wanted to give you some resources that you can take uh, and do with it what you will in your own time. Um, typing is a very important skill to kind of hone as you use computers more frequently. Um, I know my mom 
learned typewriting. She learned actually on a typewriter in high school. And it's very similar. Uh, so if you have experience uh, typing on a typewriter, it's, it's the very same thing, very same rules, how you hold your hands and the way that you move your fingers. But if you're still struggling, like you have to get used to a new keyboard or you've never interacted with a keyboard before, there are tons of tutorials and games online that you can play with to improve your typing. Um, I always did the typing games website when I was in school learning how to type uh, and the uh, GCF global typing tutorial will walk you through uh, the proper um, I, I say loosely in quotation marks there is no right or wrong way to type um, but there is a, a specific way where you hold your fingers on your home row and which finger do you use on which um, letter and that tutorial can walk you through that process. Uh, mouse use or trackpad skills. Um, again, it's something that you improve the more that you use it. There is a, a game on GCF Global as well. And then I always recommend for people to play solitaire. All of the, your mouse skills like clicking, dragging, highlighting, you'll all do in solitaire. So if you just play a couple games of solitaire, that can help you kind of get down that um, hand-eye coordination and clicking and dragging. And then any additional computer skills that I might not go over today or that you have a specific question about, GCF Global will definitely have something that will walk you through it, like a video walkthrough or a tutorial that you'll read through. Um, they have anything and everything. So definitely check uh, GCF Global if uh, none of these resources um, are quite hitting um, what you're looking for. So do we have any final questions about just basic computer use before I move on to talking about the internet? All right, so if you have any questions, again, please pop them into the chat or pop it into the Q&A and I will answer them as they come in. Much like with the other glossary I gave you, I wanted to give you another glossary specific to the internet. So if you were to schedule a one on one session with me or you were to work directly with the librarian about accessing the internet or using the internet, we will use these words most often. So it's good to kind of have an understanding of these words. I have a question in the Q&A. Uh, desktop is the monitor. That's a good question. So um, typically, I would kind of give you like a layout of what a computer, like just the, the hardware, or the different moving parts of a computer. Uh, but again, like I said, I had to kind of forego that just because of the nature of this program. Uh, to answer this question, the desktop, when I, um, often people refer to a desktop computer they mean that it's a computer that cannot be moved like a laptop so laptops you can close and carry with you anywhere desktops are kind of the computers that you'll find in the library where it's just the desktop itself and then the monitor um, so if someone says oh my desktop computer the monitor and the motherboard are kind of coupled together hopefully that answers your question kind of like a square is a rectangle, but a rectangle isn't a square. Desktop does contain the monitor, but the monitor isn't the whole desktop itself. Oops, sorry about that. All right, so moving on to the uh, glossary terms that I wanted to provide for the internet. Uh, so the internet can be referenced as either just the internet or the World Wide Web. Uh, the internet is a network of computers all over the world that are interconnected to each other. The internet is used for shopping, communication, learning, distributing information, and more. Web browser is a term that you'll hear very often. Um, I know when I um, instruct library patrons on how to access databases or use our virtual services. My very first step is always to say open your preferred web browser. And a web browser is just the program used to access the World Wide Web. So the major web browsers are Internet Explorer, Explorer Google Chrome, Firefox, and Safari. Safari is Mac only. Um, 
I people always ask me the most popular question I ever get about web browsers is which one is the best and it depends on who you're talking to I always recommend Google Chrome uh, it works across all devices uh, and it has I think probably the best um, just you know, safety um, and more I'll talk about safety later but I think Google Chrome offers the best for a free web browser and this here is just an icon of what uh, a browser icon might look like this is for Internet Explorer. URL or Uniform Resource Locator is a link that takes you to a website such as www.facebook.com. It will always have an HTTPS www prefix and a .com or .org or .edu or um, you don't really see .nets anymore, but it'll have that suffix. The com and org and edu will kind of give you an idea of what kind of website you're looking at. So .com is usually a for-profit company. So like amazon.com, facebook.com, and org is a nonprofit organization like the library, two different libraries.org. Uh, and edu is a, an educational institution. So like Westchester University is wcupa.edu. A URL bar or address box. This is the white bar at the top of all web browsers where you will type in your URL addresses. Um, people often, I notice a lot of people get this confused with the Google search bar that's often at your home page. So when you open up an Internet Explorer or Google Chrome and you don't have a home page set up, it'll automatically open to Google. So Google has a search bar and then the very top bar above that will be your URL bar. So if you have a specific website you want to navigate to, you can just pop it into that very top bar. Bookmarks and favorites um, are a really handy feature that um, can be found across all web browsers. It will let you save bookmark or favorite web pages so you can return to them. So if you have web pages that you visit daily, you can bookmark them or favorite them and have them um, on underneath your URL bar uh, as icons. And you just click the icon to the website you want to visit and it'll take you right there. It uh, bypasses the step of having to type in the URL L into the URL bar. Tabs are just multiple open pages on one web browser. Uh, this is uh, kind of tricky. Uh, it goes very un, um, unseen if you're not looking for it. Um, but I like to say that internet tabs are kind of like a filing cabinet and each tab is a folder in a drawer. So a filing cabinet can have three drawers. One drawer could be Internet Explorer and all of the files within the Internet Explorer drawer will be different windows that you have open. Um, and all of the tabs will here at the top, um, just above the URL bar. If you wanted to switch to a tab, you'll just click on the one that you want to open. Wi-Fi is wireless internet that allows you to connect to the World Wide Web on most devices. This is, <clears throat> excuse me, this is the most common way that everyone uh, accesses the internet nowadays. The library has free Wi-Fi. Most places actually, most stores now have free Wi-Fi for you to use, um, like McDonald's, Target. Uh, I know Michael's Arts and Crafts, uh, Arts and Crafts has Wi-Fi. So it can be found pretty much anywhere nowadays. Um, you can also connect using an Ethernet cable. That just means um, it's kind of like a phone line. You uh, connect it directly to your computer and you don't have to worry about connecting to the Wi-Fi via password. And hyperlinks um, are just a, a clickable link. It's reference to data you can directly follow either by clicking, tapping, or hovering. And most hyperlinks will appear blue and underlined. So if you were to look at the handout that I or sent to you or this, the PDF version of this presentation that I sent to you earlier today, I did hyperlink some of the stuff. So um, on the previous slide where I gave you resources, those blue underlined uh, sentences are links to those specific web pages. So if you just click them, it'll take you to there to that website using your web browser. I just want to give some quick tips about using the internet because it can become very overwhelming and very daunting. Um, 
and I can I can definitely understand that it was kind of challenging when I was growing up as a young teen learning how to use the internet for the first time. So I always like to remind people that um, think of the internet as a library. Both are made up of a bunch of different parts that all function together. The internet is always changing. It is one of the most useful re resources for finding information like news and entertainment, all of which can change daily. But don't let this daunt or overwhelm you. Uh, I hope that you can take some of the skills that I'll provide you or teach you today in the webinar and take it with you in the future to help kind of navigate the internet uh, more confidently. Usually only a small portion of information can immediately be seen on the web page when it loads. Uh, so scrolling is an important skill to perfect when navigating the internet. You can scroll using the scroll bar, which is uh, the bar on the right hand side of a web page, your mouse or even the arrow keys on your keyboard. And another major question that I get almost every time um, I teach this course or another course about the internet is how can I stop advertisements? And unfortunately you can't. Uh, advertisements are a necessary evil when it comes to the internet. Not everything can be free. So uh, if, you were, if you have like a Gmail account or a Hotmail or Yahoo account, I'm sure you see ads daily on your email um, and that email is free for you because of those ads. Those ads are paying that company to run essentially, which then can provide you that free service. So unfortunately, advertisements are a necessary evil. Um, I wanted to quickly go over some benefits of the internet uh, to kind of maybe get you thinking outside of the box and think about what you can use the internet for and and kind of explore options that you might not have considered before. So the very first one that I always like to mention as a librarian is reference and educational services. You can conduct all levels of research from finding a definition of a word to attending graduate courses completely online. Uh, I know myself and all of my coworkers and all of my friends have used uh, the lockdown or the pandemic as an opportunity to kind of um, broaden my experiences. I've taken a few language courses online and now I plan on taking a photography course online. I was never really able to do this before. A lot of them were in-person classes and I was too busy. I was at work or I was doing something else so I couldn't physically be there. But now with online courses that are pretty much free, a lot of libraries are offering free courses and free programs online. You can do it on your own time, which is really helpful. And we wouldn't be able to do this without the internet. And I think the next point is very relevant to our current time, free and open communication with friends or family, especially if they uh, live away from you or if they live abroad. Uh, this is a great way to stay connected with friends and family via email, Skype or FaceTime or social media like Facebook or Instagram. The internet can be used uh, for easy search for information and entertainment. You can use Google or Bing, they are search databases, to find out basic information like phone numbers, show times, restaurant hours and menus and more. And I think one of the most important now is banking and e-commerce. So this is where you can check balances or savings, complete your annual taxes or purchase items through websites for Walmart, Target and even Amazon. And with that, I like to give everyone a friendly reminder that keep in mind a lot of services are switching to paperless, which means everything as such as IRS tax forms, state tax forms and bank statements are all online now. Um, this is just an effort to kind of go green is what a lot of companies are calling it. They're saving a lot of paper. Um, and then honestly, a lot of steps, if they can send out a blast email to everyone, all of their users, it saves the time and effort of typing up a memo, printing it out, putting it in an envelope and addressing all of those letters. It's just so much easier to email people now. Um, and I do like to say banks uh, with the bank statements, I know my personal bank, I actually have um, kind of 
a reward for switching to online bank statements. Uh, my bank charges for paper bank statements. Uh, and if I were to switch to online, they would waive that fee for me. It's a very small fee, um, but it's a great, um, I think, great way for the bank to kind of incentivize the switching to paperless. Uh, so before I move on to our next topic, are there any questions or comments about anything that I've gone over so far? I know I'm throwing a lot at you uh, in a very short amount of time, so please don't hesitate to ask any questions. Right, next, I'm going to go over computer basic or internet safety uh, in terms of computer basics. Uh, I think this is the probably the most important portion of this webinar. Um, a lot of questions I get are about, you know, scams or kind of controlling spammy emails. And this is where you'll get all of that information. Again, I wanted to give you kind of a glossary of words that you'll hear most often when talking about staying safe on the internet or just kind of understanding how different web browsers keep you safe or what they do with your data. So viruses are malicious code or program written to alter the way a computer operates and is designed to spread from one computer to another. Usually viruses are accidentally downloaded. Uh, say you try to download a program and you download something that looks like the program you're looking for, but it isn't. Um, it's false, it's malicious, and it's a program that is designed to infect your computer so that it can infect other computers. So you have to be really careful with anything that you open from your email or anything that you download from online. Phishing is a fraudulent attempt to obtain sensitive information such as disguising oneself as a trustworthy entity in an electronic communication. This I think is the most common scam you will come across when using the internet. Um, it's, it's very, very common. Um, everyone fall either can potentially fall victim or people attempt to fish you and you recognize it. Um, for example, I was on Craigslist looking for a new apartment and there was a phishing scam on a listing that I was looking at and I noticed right away that it was a phishing scam and to not give them my email or any sensitive information and I can kind of um, explain more about phishing um, coming up but you just have to be really careful about any unsolicited emails or emails that you don't recognize and make sure you don't click any links and don't provide any information like your social security number, credit card information or anything like that unless you um, know who you are giving that to. Malware is a malicious software uh, which varies between viruses, ransomware, trojans and spyware. Antivirus software is a computer program used to prevent, detect, and remove malware. For example, Norton or McAfee, which all computers come with. Um, I believe there is still a free version of antivirus software on Windows computers. And Macs, um, we have pretty strong security as is. So Macs don't come with a, an antivirus software that you have to actively scan and make sure everything is up to date. Macs are pretty secure. Firewalls and antivirus software kind of go hand in hand, but firewalls um, is a network security system that monitors and controls incoming and outgoing network traffic based on predetermined security rules. So for example, private Wi-Fi connections like the one that you might have at home will have a strong firewall to protect you, um, but uh, any public Wi-Fi connection will have a weak firewall uh, just because it's public. Uh, if we had strong firewalls for public Wi-Fi, it would be more difficult for everyone to join onto that Wi-Fi for free. The next two are just, it's just words that you probably hear often when using the internet, especially with the cookies. Now, um, I believe, uh, I'm not quite sure what the law 
there a law has been passed recently where websites have to tell you that they are using cookies um, and cookies are just a small piece of data stored on the user's computer by the web browser while browsing a website this is just a tool uh, for websites to remember useful information or to record the user's browsing activity this helps with the website um, make sure it doesn't lag make sure it works well and then a web cache is kind of similar. It's just temporary storage of web documents such as web pages, images, and other types of web multimedia to reduce server lag. When using the uh, internet or when on your preferred web browser, you do have the option of clearing your cookies and clearing your web cache. If you don't like that, the web browser is uh, keeping small pieces of data or, or temporary storage of documents um, it's basically kind of like a detailed history of what you were doing on your browser. But you can um, clear those if you don't feel comfortable with it. I wanted to go over the basic ways of safeguarding your privacy online. And the very first, um, I guess the very first tip or the very first option is to create safe passwords and to manage your passwords well. Uh, and this can help against hackers. Do not use the same password for every account. Use different passwords for all major accounts. If you were to use the same password for every account and your hacker figures out your email password, they can then get into all of your accounts with that same password. So you wanna make sure that you change up your password for every individual account. I know it's a lot to ask. Passwords can be really difficult to remember. I know they're are times where I create a password and forget it the next day. Uh, there are options for you to always recreate your password or recover your account if you do forget your password. Um, one other option is you can keep a little kind of notebook in your bag or near your computer if you if you are working on a computer for home, from home um, where you can write down all of your different passwords if you need to remember them that way. I have um, someone in uh, the Q&A asking, how do you delete cookies and other history? I can show you how to do that um, on Google Chrome. Um, I can do that um, at the end. I'll switch my screen share to Google Chrome and show you how to kind of play around with your history, uh, how to delete cookies and history, and then also how to browse uh, on a, uh, a private um, Google tab or uh, private mode, which uh, disables the web browser from collecting your history. I'll do that um, at the end. Um, so going back to creating safe passwords, uh, you want to use a combination of upper and lowercase numbers, or I'm sorry, upper and lowercase letters, numbers, and characters. Usually now, um, when you have to create an account, like say for your bank or for Facebook or uh, creating a new email, I, I believe now most major websites will require you to have at least one upper, one lower case letter, one number, and one character. Uh, but if it doesn't require that, I would still recommend doing it and making the password at least eight letters long or eight characters long. Create passwords that are easy for you to remember, but something difficult for others to think of. So don't use like your mom's maiden name or your maiden name or your last name, your first name, your husband's name, your wife's name, your children's name. If it's something that someone close to you or someone kind of close to you can figure out, then you may need to think of something a little bit stronger. Do not use personal information like your birth date names or sequential or pattern numbers like 123, 121, or 741. Safeguard your private and uh, safeguard your sensitive and private information when online. So never post your full name, address or phone number, social security number, passwords, credit card or bank account numbers, names of family or friends and other identifying information. And always make sure you're on a secure network and website when shopping online and accessing your bank account. Um, if you were to use a public network or a public Wi-Fi connection, there is a greater chance of hackers hacking into your, um, your Wi-Fi connection and getting sensitive information like your credit card information and your bank login. And remember, once something is on the internet, it is there forever and anyone can see it. I know the internet seems kind of like a great big void. It's almost like a black hole of just it's just so much out there. Um, 
but don't let that fool you. Once you put something out there, it's there forever. Now dealing with spam and scams, uh, unsolicited emails are probably the most common spam that you'll come across. Um, common email service providers have spam filters, but sometimes spam does get through. Do not open anything you do not recognize, either from the sender or the title of the email. Another, um, scammers are getting super creative nowadays. Um, one thing that they'll do is they'll pose as maybe like your boss or a family member, they'll use their name, but hide the email. So it could say, this email is coming from Zoe Mills, but it's not from me. Uh, and it'll ask you to do something like, buy me $50 worth of Starbucks gift cards and send me a picture of the gift cards. Don't do that. Always make sure you read the email and make sure it is from the email that you know belongs to that person. Do not open anything you do not recognize, either from the sender or the title of the email. This is how you can accidentally download a virus onto your computer. And same thing with clicking any links. If you click a link, it might take you to a website that'll put malware onto your computer. And mark the email as spam and promptly delete the spam emails that were not filtered. So if you were to mark it as spam, your email service provider, provider will mark that uh, email account as spam will automatically set it um, to the spam folder or junk folder. I wanted to go over the three major types of scams, but before I do that, I wanted to kind of disclaim that these are just the most common scams that I've come across or that I've heard of. Scammers and hackers are becoming more creative to steal your information or harm your computers. So it's always good to stay up to date with different scams and know how to protect yourself. Uh, the first scam is personal emergency. Uh, scammers will pose as a friend or relative claiming distress. Uh, I always recommend directly contacting that person by calling or visiting them to confirm if they do need help or they do need money. Owing money, be wary of emails that claim you owe money, like from the IRS or from banks. Typically, these organizations will reach out in other ways than email. I know there has been a phone scam, um, especially within the Tredefin area of, the, of people claiming to be the IRS, saying you owe us money. Um, the very first thing that the IRS will do, they will send you snail mail. They'll send you a letter in the mail if you do actually owe money. So always be weary about anyone claiming to be the bank or the IRS. And when in doubt, directly con contact that institution to confirm you are in good standing. For example, I received an email from my bank claiming that um, my credit card was used overseas. I wound up just calling my bank directly saying, hey, I got this email. It doesn't seem real to me. I think it might be a scam. And they were able to confirm or deny that it was not a scam or anything like that. So I felt more comfortable myself directly asking the bank, hey, what's up with this email? It seems weird to me, rather than just kind of thinking that it's a real email and that my credit card information was stolen. And there are online dating scams, um, catfishing. Uh, there's actually a show about it's called catfish um, it's based off of the documentary which i highly recommend um, but catfishing is where someone poses as someone else to get attention or money never send any money over the internet and we also have another question in the q a uh, how do you put something in spam so it depends on your um, your email servicer um, i personally use uh, Google Chrome. Um, it, if I were to receive it in the email in my uh, or in my Gmail or my Google email, sorry, I misspoke. I said Google Chrome. I meant Gmail. Um, if I were to receive email not in the spam folder, I can. Um, there's the bar at the very top when you open an email. It'll say mark as spam, and you just click mark as spam, and then it'll dump it into your spam folder. Oops. So I mentioned making sure that you um, shop and bank safely online about using, make sure you don't use public Wi-Fi, always make sure that you are on a private connection, like your own Wi-Fi that has, that is password protected. Um, 
make sure you are shopping from a verified website. Um, always make sure, you know, it is the actual website that you are intending to visit, like walmart.com or amazon.com. You can always browse their about page to, to verify if it is an actual website and it is an actual e-commerce site. You can usually spot fake websites by like, you know, grammar errors, syntax errors. It just seems a little off. Um, and if the website is like brand new, usually that means it's not a verified website. It's almost like fact checking the way that you would fact check your news or fact check any articles that you're reading um, for just information or for news, you would do the same way with websites. When using a credit card, make sure the web page is secure. So I have two pictures here to kind of show you what it looks like when a web page is secure and one when it is not secure. So when it is secure, there is a lock. There's always a lock no matter which, what browser you're using, Internet Explorer, Google Chrome, Safari, Firefox. It will always have a lock if it is secure. And if you were to click on that lock, it'll give you some information about uh, why the connection is secure, uh, the certificate of the website, cookies, and anything else like that. And then if it is not secure, it'll either be an unlocked lock or it'll be kind of like a warning sign saying this is not secure. Do not put any in sensitive information on this site like passwords or credit cards um, because it is not safe. So what does secure mean anyway? When a website is secure, your credit card information is encrypted, so scammers cannot access your information. So you always want to make sure you're shopping and even browsing on secure uh, websites. And this is just a little um, kind of like infographic uh, that I distinctly remember seeing in um, our computer room uh, in high school. It was, it was always be smart on the internet. So S is for stay safe. Don't give out any personal information. M, don't meet up. Be weary when meeting up with an online stranger, which isn't really um, a danger nowadays. You don't wanna be meeting up with anyone uh, for safety, but as always be weary um, when, you know, when things do go back to normal and you meet someone online, be weary with meeting up with them. Be weary with accepting files. Don't download or access files from emails that seem suspicious or are from someone you don't know. Is it reliable? Always fact check everything on the internet before you comment, interact, or share with someone. And then T for tell someone. If something seems suspicious or out of the ordinary, ask someone who may be more comfortable with technology for help, like a reference librarian. And that pretty much concludes the major things that I wanted to kind of highlight in terms of basic computer use. I can uh, switch my screen share to Google Chrome to kind of show you the ins and outs of what your history might look like, how to delete cookies, how to delete, uh, clear your cache, and then how to browse privately. But before I switch screen shares, does anyone have any other questions or comments that I can address before I do that? I have a question here. If the site is insecure or unsecure, then will the hackers be able to hack the whole computer or just the information of that site? I I would say that it's it's probably just information that you input on that site. Um, unsecure websites will still track um, just like secure websites. So you saw in this image here that Amazon is is a secure connection, but they do use cookies. Um, so when a website is not secure, it just means that it won't encrypt everything that you put in. So if you were to input credit card information, emails, passwords, etc., it won't be encrypted and hackers can get that information. And then I also wanted to quickly provide uh, my contact information and the contact information for the libraries. So if you wanted more assistance, I didn't quite go over what you were hoping to um, see tonight. You can always email me, give me a call. I do have limited access to the phone. I am still working from home part of the time. So I, I don't, uh, I'm not always there to answer my phone. I'm not always there to listen to my voicemails. So you can always shoot me an email or you can schedule a one-on-one -on -one text session uh, if you wanted more direct assistance. 
If not, you can always call the library or email the library for any help. And this is our website.